welcome to Economy and Markets TV, the show that takes you around the world of economic and financial news. I'm your host, Dave Oakenquist, Senior Research Analyst here at Dent. It is Friday, which means it's time for the weekly dive into the news of the week. And that also means I bring on Rodney Johnson. Rodney, good morning. Morning, Dave. Rodney is the Senior Editor and Co-Founder of Dent Research. He's also my partner in crime every Friday on this show, where we tease out the handful of the best news items of the week and go through them. Sort of in a, a quick way, we try to limit things to about two minutes. I've got a bell here. I'm never afraid to use this puppy. Right now, you ready to get into our first topic? Let's do it. All right. So um, we're gonna. This is about debt. Um, consumer credit growth slowed in March. It expanded 11.6 billion on expectations of 15.6 billion. So obviously, we don't want. We're not encouraging people to go into debt, but debt is an important indicator on the levels of consumption, right, Rodney? It is. I mean, it's what you put on your credit card, right? And so if we're not putting more on our credit cards, then we're not going our spending. It's kind of hand in hand there because people aren't spending down their savings uh, to do that sort of thing. And so this has been one of the things that's frustrating a lot of people who watch the economy because they expected people to feel better about the economy and therefore turn around and break out the plastic and just start spending like crazy. Uh, we've been talking about this for a long time here on this show, of course, and the digest and the boom and bust. But right. we don't expect it because you know we all have our problems. The, the millennials are coming along with a huge amount of student loan debt for those that went to college or tried to go to college. And then, of course, you have the other end of the baby boomers that are preparing for retirement. So they can feel good about the economy, but they still have to focus on what's important in their world. And I can look out and say, wow, things look pretty good, but I still got a plan for you know the last 30 years of my life. So we've never expected this to be a big boom to spending with the tax cuts and everything. And that's, of course, showing itself in the modest growth in consumer credit. Yeah. So yes. we're all getting it, or most of us anyways, are getting just a little bit extra in our checks. And uh, we're not, yep. yeah, we're just not going out and, and leveraging that into something bigger, paying down existing debt. Uh, interesting thing, I found a story that came out on millennials, uh, their credit card usage. I guess, you know, there was something, some headline about, uh, you know, are millennials going to kill the credit card? But it's interesting. If you look at 18 to 29 year olds, I got a chart in front of me, uh, mm -hmm. 33%. And, uh, but if, when you go through the other generations, 30 to 49, it's, it's 55%, 50 to 64, 62%. And, uh, one of the things they found in a survey is that mo most millennials just, they prefer cash or a debit card. A lot of them just, you know, as you see, only a third actually have a credit card. And this is after all this stuff that we heard about, uh, colleges preying on students and all that. That seems to be gone. Which is good, right? You want people to be more conservative and, and more responsible in their financial lives. I'd be interested in knowing how many uh, of the young group carry a balance uh, over the end of the month, because that's really the marker of what you're doing with your debt. Mm. Uh, but the fact that they're not using it at the same rate as uh, Gen X or the boomers tells you a lot. And it's good individually, but it does hold economic growth back. And frankly, we thought that was going to be the story for some time. Yeah, for sure. All right, moving on to our next topic. Uh, President Trump pulled out of the Iran Iran deal, which uh, you know the, once again the world exploded. Uh, yep. But uh, we don't want to really touch that at all. But uh, this is this is going to have a big impact on oil prices, Rodney. Right? And you also earlier this week you wrote a piece in Economy and Markets, uh, not quite on the Iran deal, but about oil. So talk a bit on that. Yeah, and, and we've been watching oil for some time. Of course, I've talked about it here the last couple of weeks. Prices are back in the 70s to 80s, which is great for the U.S. economy now that we are producing so much and even exporting after uh, President Obama removed the um, decree on exporting back in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's good for us. The lower supply overseas is really what's driving prices higher and the worry about it. And you mentioned the Iranian deal, of course, that we wrote about for uh, Digest. As Trump pulled out, some sanctions snap right back. And, and some of those sanctions apply to the international oil market. And so we expect that we'll see supply from Iran drop by at least a couple hundred thousand barrels a day on top of the 200,000 supply cut from OPEC and its co-conspirator group. And so that's going to keep prices higher. And you can't forget the Venezuelans who are basically just killing their oil production as they are the rest of their economy. And so yeah. the, the lower production, lower supply drives prices higher and eventually leads to good things here in the United States. Pay a little bit more in gas prices, which is what I talked about in economy of markets, but that's still well under control because our cars are so much more efficient than they have been, been in the past. We don't buy as much gasoline as we did years ago. So kind of in a good place. Yeah, absolutely. Now for the non-Iranian OPEC members with supply cuts, they might welcome this price walk up, won't they? I think they will. I mean, because their their supply is going to be the same, right? You you cut your supply a little bit as part of this OPEC deal or one of the, you know, the non-OPEC members like Russia who are part of it. 
And so you're still producing the same as you agreed to, and yet the price walks up because somebody else has a problem. And so not quite schadenfreude where you're pretty excited somebody else has a problem, but not upset about it either because yeah. you're making more money. Exactly. It's all about bringing in that oil money. So, yeah, uh, yeah that's all we had on that one. But certainly, yeah, we're going to be in a, a higher price environment for oil, and that's uh, that's, a, that's a good news for us, at least American companies. So Yeah. Yeah. All right. The next thing we had is CPI or inflation. Uh, it was up 0.2%, um, just a little bit less than, than estimates there. Core was only up 0.1%. Um, so this sounds like uh, one, of the, oh, one of the things I noticed too was uh, car prices are slipping, both the new cars and especially used cars. Um, yeah. But you know, this sounds like good news for those that have been worried about inflation over the last couple of months. Isn't it, Rodney? It is. And there's a couple more pieces in there. Uh, everybody was worried after last month about inflation walking higher, driving up interest rates. The 10-year bond got back over 3% uh, this past week before dropping back after the inflation numbers came out. Uh, but if you see the Fed pushing rates higher on the short end, you're now at you know, 1.5 to 1.75. We're going to 2 this year. Yeah. Uh, the worry was they would push it over 2 this year and really start crimping uh, the economic expansion as slow and moderate as it's been. Um, but with this number, everybody says, hey, maybe they're not going to raise as many times as we thought they were. Uh, but the other side is still important. It's wage growth. And wage growth is now tracking a lot like inflation. And so you don't see workers making much headway. As you mentioned a minute ago, we got a little bit of a bump uh, from the tax cut, but we're not getting any love um, on the wage growth side outpacing inflation. And with that, you're not going to get a lot more spending, which, of course, leads back to the first thing. It all keeps growth kind of moderate. Yeah, that's sort of muddling through, right? As you like to yep, say. That's exactly it. Yeah, so maybe uh, maybe we'll see a little bit uh, on, on rates not rising quite as much. But this again, this is just one month. We can come back next month and, have, and it'll be that same <laughs> inflation Absolutely. hysteria. So something to keep an eye on. That's really all I had on that one. The last bit we had, this, this one is almost a bonus. This is like... Not real news, I don't think. I'm not sure if this is real life. Uh, California Energy Commission approves a requirement that all homes have solar panels by January 1st, 2020. Well, the thing is, it's not quite final yet, so we're still in fake life. But, <laughs> Rodney, what is this about? This can't be a good idea. It, it's all new homes. So every home that's built beginning in 2020, January 1st, 2020, must right. have uh, solar panels. It doesn't mean you can't do it now. And so you'll see builders start moving in that direction. A lot of people ask for it today. It is an option in California. It is in a lot of places. Um, we're getting away from the, the model that was around a few years ago. We all got those calls from people. If I can show you how to save money on your electric bill, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And so that was a weird leasing of the equipment, strange thing uh, that we didn't think was last, it would last and told people to stay away from as a financing thing. And it has created quite a problem because those systems are no longer generating the cash they were. Um, the, the problem in California is that so many people have moved to solar, which sounds good, that they're overrunning the existing utility system by pushing power back up the grid. Yeah. And so when there's you know uh, moderate temperatures and a lot of sunshine, people aren't using as much, it all pushes back up the grid and the utility has to do something with it or else you overload the system. And so there, there's some struggles working through this uh, on an efficiency front or just you know going through all the procedures. Um, it's great that we're using renewable. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be good for Tesla. Tesla now owns Solar City. They're going to be pretty thrilled about this. Um, but having it mandated like that, never a fan of that. I'd love to see the market pull that through instead of the government pushing it. Yeah, so it sounds like you'd need some sort of a reconfiguration of the grid for this to really work because it, it just doesn't, it's not really built to handle that sort of thing. Uh, probably, and, and there are some caveats as to what can be done. Perhaps you don't have to put solar on every single roof. Perhaps you can put uh, a central location in a neighborhood. You can put a battery system that will take some of the energy from a photo array nearby. There are some caveats in there that are probably better efficiencies mm -hmm. uh, than putting some on every single roof because every time you have solar panels, you also need that photovoltaic in the garage and all the crazy stuff that goes with it. Right. And it, it's better to do that in a central location. It's much more efficient, which is what other states have done. Absolutely. That last comment here, you mentioned Solar City. <laughs> Elon Musk seems to come up a lot here. And it's just, it's just, I understand, you know, the critics, because here he is struggling with Tesla. We've got batteries catching fire, but hey, he's got a deal here going on with the Solar City thing. It's going to be great. It's amazing, right? He just lives to fight another day and puts rockets into space. And um, 
none of these companies make a profit, but oh. you know, it seems to be okay for them so far. <laughs> yeah, it works out pretty well. I need to figure that one out too. Yep. Uh, so that's Maybe he makes it up on volume, right? I lose money on every unit, but I make yeah. it up on volume. <laughs> the math somehow works. I don't know. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's really all we had for news items. Uh, looking into next week, we've got retail sales. I'll have my eyes on automobiles. Uh, we're going to have housing starts and industrial production. Rodney, anything else coming up next week that you want to mention? Uh, trade is still out there. Of course, you know, the meeting uh, with the North Korean leader was set for June in Singapore. That's interesting. Um, but we've had a trade delegation over in China for some days, and now it appears that the lead trade negotiator for China is coming here. That, that hasn't been officially announced and set that I know of, uh, but that's good news. And I think that you'll see the markets pop on that. We just finished earnings. It looks like earnings in the S&P 500 grew 24%, which is absolutely amazing for a quarter, something we've been looking for along with stock buybacks. And those two things we believe are going to drive the markets higher here in the short term. A trade deal would also give us a great pop. But then it's that thing of, okay, moderate growth, kind of slow, muddling along. That's all going to come back. And after this incredible quarter fades, I think we're going to have some difficulty as we come through the summer. Mm, excellent. Thank you for that wrap up, Rodney. Thank you, as always, for appearing here. I want to thank everybody for watching. Remember, you can find us at DentResearch.com and EconomyAndMarkets.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again.